Hello, I think we are live. Hello everyone and welcome to another Quantum London webinar. I have the pleasure with Anahita tonight to introduce you to another of our uh, events. Uh, shall be an interesting one. I will go uh, very briefly into what we are going to discuss about in a second. But first of all, I would like to uh, introduce Quantum London for whoever is new to the group. And we are a community of people who are passionate and curious about quantum computing, quantum technologies, and are trying to understand what the business implications of uh, this wave or new things coming our, our way is going to be for our businesses. And um, we do this through events like this one tonight, where we bring in experts from the field, explaining to us um, you know, what, what this is going to look like. Uh, we know there is a lot of questions at the moment, but we're trying to unravel all the complexity. And we also do it with you know, some more informal conversations. We do it from time to time, where we, as a group and as a community, we try to answer some of those questions. Um, yeah, I would like to stress, you know, this is a very friendly environment. We proud ourselves of being a very welcoming group and, you know, where compared to other um, groups where there is, um, you know, um, going very deep into the details and a lot of expertise there, we try to introduce and translate the complexity to, to uh, the business people. Uh, I see there are a lot of people in the chat, yes, and um, as you see on the left-hand side, there is a, a chat window which you, we can use to ask questions to for our speaker. And uh, together with me tonight is Anahita from Quantum London as well. Hello. And we may also have Paolo behind the scenes in stealth mode moderating the chat as well. So for tonight, we have prepared a really interesting talk. We bring to you a really interesting speaker. His name is Doug Fink and is the co-founder and managing director of the Quantum Computing Report. So the Quantum Computing Report is a leading market analysis resource which has been uh, out there since 2015 and is being recognized for being um, a great source for deep knowledge around the uh, quantum computing ecosystem, providing an understanding of what's happening in the space. So the ecosystem is something which is very close to our hearts. Uh, we touched on this a few times in previous webinars, but also we discuss this very often in our uh, Stantich, our Q&A sessions as a community. So we are very happy to, to cover this topic again with the great help of Doug Fink. So Doug, without any further ado from my side, I don't want to take any more time for introductions. If you'd like to come up on camera and uh, yeah, introduce yourself and tell us everything about the quantum computing report and the give us a tour of the quantum ecosystem. Okay. So, Thank you so much. I, uh, I'm looking forward to talking with you and, and good afternoon. Let me uh, bring up my presentation and we'll get started. One. So the another presentation is already, yes, I would like to start. Um, Okay, uh, let me know if you can see the uh, screen now. Hello, can you see the screen? Can you yes, please, yes. Oh, okay, very good. Uh -huh. Okay, so uh, let me start again. My name is Doug Fink. I'm the managing editor of the Quantum Computing Report. Um, if you have any follow-up questions after this, a session. Uh, here's my email, dfink at quantumcomputingreport.com. Just a little bit about uh, the website. It is the leading news analysis site for the quantum industry. I actually started in 2015. Um, I have many years of experience in the classical computing industry. Um, and at that time, I was got interested in quantum. And I s found out that no one was really covering it like I was used to in the classical computing industry. So I, I decided to start it up. Uh, we have thousands of visitors every month. Uh, we publish a newsletter every Sunday. Um, and I'll just mention it in, in Word. But we also have a, uh, what I call a very high quality audience. Um, the quantum computing report is read worldwide 
by executives in the quantum industry, uh, venture capitalists, government an policy analysts, re researchers from universities, government labs, as, as well as, of course, commercial companies. And, and the style is that we report on the news, but we do it in a very concise manner that, that gives you the information you need and without the hype. And that, that's different than what you might see in the popular press that tends to overhype things, uh, at least in my, my opinion. Um, for those of you who want to keep up with Quantum, uh, we do have a newsletter. It comes out every Sunday. Uh, just go to our homepage. You can see the link here. And uh, you can sign up and, and you can get it. There's no charge for that. We also keep uh, some archives uh, of the material. We have some proprietary database. Uh, that does require a, a membership. It, it, it's a paid membership. And if you're interested in getting even more details, uh, you can certainly register. As uh, You can find it on the web website. So for this presentation, uh, what I wanted to talk about is the breadth of the organizations that are working to develop quantum technology. I, uh, I track over 200 organizations, probably more like 300 or e even more, and that's just for the quantum computing and quantum communications industry. Uh, it doesn't include things like quantum sensing or, or even uh, some of the component level suppliers who are important, but um, we, we're focused more on the, the people who are actually delivering the products. So um, the, what we'll talk about are people who are technology providers, including the hardware, software, and, and infrastructure, uh, and many, many support organizations uh, like Quantum London here. And uh, because there are so many, I, I have a lot of examples in this presentation, but uh, I will apologize if your favorite organization isn't shown. Um, we just uh, would have to go on this, this presentation for four hours or so if I wanted to list every single company, but I'm, I'm just giving some examples. So let me start with, with this. This, I think, is perhaps the most important slide in the entire presentation. Um, it's important to understand that if you want to deliver quantum computing capability to an end user, you really have to provide the entire stack, all the, all the way from the chip at the lowest level to really a, a user community at, at, at the very end. And, and there's many layers in between, um, and, and very few companies can actually do everything by the, themselves. Perhaps the only companies that might be able to to do something like that would be companies like IBM or Microsoft, uh, maybe Google. But e even those companies are setting up partnerships to uh, develop software that, that helps run their systems. But to talk about all the individual things, there are many, many players in the quantum industry, and some only will play at, at certain levels. I think uh, everyone understands what the chip would do. That's where the qubits sit. Um, packaging is, is also critical in the mechanicals. Um, you hear a lot about the dilution refrigerators. Uh, those are very, very important for some of the technologies like superconducting or uh, uh, quantum dot type of qubits. Uh, the control electronics are, are important. Um, the, these uh, quantum machines are controlled typically either by microwave pulses or by lasers. There's firmware that controls the quantum electronics. Uh, and then there's stuff that's perhaps a little bit more similar to what you might see in the classical industry. There's, uh, I, I call them transpilers or gate optimizers. And sometimes they're called uh, compilers in the classical in industry. But the gates that you might be taught at, at the university level or in a basic course, like the Hadamard gate or the C not gate. Um, those aren't necessarily implemented directly on the quantum chips themselves. The quantum chips uh, typically will have some some what are called native gates, and you need to convert the C nots and the Hadamard gates and whatever to those native gates so it runs on the machine. But that that's all done by software, and of course you have the software frame frameworks that 
I, I think many of you are familiar with like the quantum development kit from Microsoft, Q Sharp, um, um, Q Sharp is their language, Kiz Kit, um, and then many software libraries. We'll, we'll talk about that. Uh, the cloud infrastructure, is, how do you hook these machines up so that people can access it over the internet? And then the, the education user community uh, is also very important because if people don't know how to use these machines, um, even if they're very powerful, they won't be able to take advantage of it. And then off to the side here, I have the component suppliers who make all this happen. Uh, you know, they're the people who sell the dilution refrigerators and other things. And, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about them uh, in some upcoming slides. Um, and finally, on the other hand, you also have support organizations. You know, these are people who may not directly provide quantum computing software or services, but uh, they're very important. Uh, certainly universities and, and investors, uh, various labs, trade organizations um, like Quantum London, various media consultants and, and governments. All those are groups and organizations that help make quantum happen, even though they may not do it directly, they will provide funds or education or support in other ways. So let me first talk about the hardware uh, providers, uh, people are working on hardware that does quantum computing. Um, and I'll, I'll start with the component suppliers. Um, there's a lot of different components that are made. Uh, I'm sure many of you have seen these pictures of things that are called chandeliers. Sometimes they look like chandeliers. Uh, those are dilution refrigerators. Uh, there are several companies in that business. One of the leading ones um, is Oxford. Actually, I should have included them. Oxford uh, Instruments. Uh, Blue Force is another one. Uh, there are companies that provide instrumentation. Um, lasers, photon detectors, even something that you might think is simple like a coaxial cable uh, may not actually be so simple um, you know, because you have to have them be reliable uh, any, in a cable that starts at room temperature and goes down to 15 millikelvin. And then connectors, terminators, um, and then finally they're the, they're the wafer fabs. Um, the uh, many of these these things are based on chips. Uh, Global Foundries is actually one of the leading semiconductor wafer fabs. They're actually doing work for two companies that I know of, uh, Psi Quantum and Equal One. Uh, some companies are doing using university wafer fabs, but uh, these are certainly very important to, to build the qubits. Uh, the one that's most unusual, I think, is a company in Italy. It's called Gopian. Uh, Gopian's primary business is to create these glass enclosures for museums. You, you walk into something like maybe the British Museum or, or one of those things, you'll see perhaps a statue or an ancient antique that's in a glass enclosure. That's made by Gopian, but a couple of years ago, IBM contracted with them, and they've created the glass enclosure for their quantum computers, what they call the quantum system uh, IBM Q System 1, uh, and again, you see that a lot in pictures. It's a, a nice blue, has a nice blue tint to it. Now, the people who are actually developing the qubits, that's one of the things we track on, on the uh, quantum computing website, um, and there are many people who are doing that. Um, some are done at universities, university, uh, government labs, certainly public companies and private companies. Uh, right now, we're tracking 90 different organizations that are developing qubits of one type or the other um, and 119 projects. And this, of course, means that some organizations are actually working on multiple technologies. This is a listing of all the different types of technologies that you can use to build qubits. Um, and, and this is a sort of a breakdown of who's doing what. I, I have a on the website, I have a more detailed breakdown, but uh, right now you can see in the lead, there are 26 organizations working on superconducting technologies, 21 on trapped ions, um, spin qubits or, or quantum dots are, are 20, there's 22 companies doing photonics. So 
you know, one of the questions that people ask me is, well, which technology is going to dominate? And I think it's too early to tell. It's sort of like the early days of the semiconductor industry where you had a lot of different technologies that people were working on, like germanium and silicon and NMOS and CMOS and bipolar, and a similar thing's happening in quantum. So uh, on one hand, you know, it, 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 it you know, causes some uncertainty. People don't know which ones to back, particularly if you're an investor, uh, which ones I should invest in. But, you know, from my standpoint, I, I actually think at this stage of the game where there's so much uh, uncertainty about quantum and if it will work and when it will work, the fact that you have a very good diversity of approaches I think is a positive thing because some of these won't work, but I'm sure some of, the, some of these will, so that, um, that will be good. Um, examples of people, uh, these are the large companies who are developing uh, technologies. Uh, I think most of you are familiar with IBM, Google, uh, Honeywell has not been in the classical indus computing industry for a long time. They were at the very beginning, but uh, they're now um, back. They're working on quantum with ion traps. Of course, everyone knows Intel and, and Microsoft. But, but the other thing is um, there's a large number of startup companies, including many in, in the UK, that are working on, on different technologies. Uh, you know, certainly Orca Computing, Oxford Ionics, Oxford Quantum, uh, uh, Quantum Motion, Tundra, Universal. So there, there's actually a lot of startups in the UK. There's certainly many in the US also, uh, you know, some in Canada, some in Australia. So uh, this is a worldwide, or, uh, worldwide ecosystem. Um, uh, interesting fact is that when I monitor the traffic on my own website, uh, the ma majority of the traffic is actually from outside the U.S. So unlike perhaps classical computing, it is certainly not dominated uh, by the U.S. There's a lot of people. And um, now going further uh, upwards in that stack of that inverted pyramid that I was talking about, you have companies that are specializing in quantum controls and, and, and quantum software. Uh, you know, some of the interesting things, is, and you don't really see this really in the classical computing industry, but quantum technology is uh, controlled by, by control pulses. Uh, as I said earlier, either laser pulses or microwave pulses that will be aimed at the qubits and force the qubits to to implement the gates. Um, it, it turns out that coming up with the right set of pulses, the the right amplitudes, the right frequencies, the right durations, uh, the, the right phases, it, it is really a science. There's two companies that are really specializing that. One is based in Australia called Q Control. They also have a, an office here in the US. And the other is a company in Canada that's called Quantum Benchmark. And um, this is very important because it, by optimizing those pulses, you can optimize the quality of the qubits. Um, I'm sure many of you have heard of people talk about qubit fidelity and gate fidelity and decoherence times. And those can all be improved if you have the right set of pulses. So these companies are specializing in that very, very particular area of, of uh, I would call it firmware. And um, it's, it's a, a very, very you know, interesting thing. And, and the latest advance, I might just say this, uh, Q-Control just announced last week that they're using uh, artificial intelligence to help them calibrate and come up with the optimal control sequence. But uh, beyond the software, of course, you need the, the uh, electronics. You, you need uh, arbitrary waveform generators and things to measure it. Um, and there's at least four companies that I'm tracking that are in that business. Um, QBlox is based in the Netherlands, uh, Quantum Machines in Israel, uh, Keysight and Labber are, are here in the US. Zurich Instruments is in Switzerland. So 
Uh, these companies are, are developing the, this uh, control systems hardware. At the same time, um, some of the companies like IBM and Rigetti have all, can also develop their own. So this, uh, you know, so some companies have a make or buy type of decision whether to, you know, acquire one of these or develop their own control electronics. On the software side, um, I, I had mentioned this again, the poly gates, Hadamard, C not gates, et cetera. Um, those are typically what you'll learn. Uh, typically what you'll see in, in the quantum platforms if, if you're using that. But at the, at the hardware level, there's native, these things called native gates that uh, might just do a rotation and you have to figure out how you might want to implement a Hadamard gate with um, gates that you know do certain types of rotation. So the, the transpiler um, is is something that does that. It will convert that. Uh, at the same time, you want to optimize the programs. Um, one of the things that people are always concerned about is certainly minimizing the number of gates, minimizing the number of qubits you need to implement your algorithm but uh, something called circuit depth. How many gates you, you have acting on a qubit in, in a row before you're finished with your algorithm? And this is really important because the smaller of, of a circuit, each time you go through a gate, you lose a little bit of the accuracy or, or the quality. So by minimizing the circuit depth, you can improve the overall quality of, of the answer and it, and certainly improve uh, or lower the error rate. So there's a lot of work being done on that. Um, I know, you know one company in the UK that's done a lot of work in that is Cambridge Quantum Computing. Uh, they're using something, uh, I just saw a paper they put out on ZX Calculus, which is something that they use to help that, and they have a pretty good uh, translator. And then finally, um, sometimes you want to transla translate a program from one architecture to, to another. Uh, at the gate level, the quantum computers are, are not really fully compatible. Uh, for example, the set of native gates on an ion trap machine are going to be much different than the set of native gates you'd see on a superconducting machine. So um, uh, there are companies that make backends, and I'll, I'll talk about that in a second, but let me perhaps talk about the, the hardware providers who are providing the software for their own machines. Uh, IBM has a Kiz Kit, a Google has CERC, I, uh, Rigetti has Forest, D-Wave has, has something called uh, Leap, um, and D-Wave's a special, special type of company or, or has a special technology because it's not gate-based. It uses something called quantum annealing, um, but there are a few people who actually uh, offer software that are called optimizers that allow you to program the optimizer and then or program your problem or tell them what the problem is and it can develop a solution either for the gate based machines or for the quantum annealing machines like like leap um, but one of the things that i've seen in the past couple years is a term that i'll, I'll call it hard, uh, hardware agnostic one of the things that you're seeing from many of the software suppliers, uh, like Cambridge Quantum Computing or Xanadu or QCWare or, or Zapata, is that you can program a program in, in one of the front ends, either their own or possibly something like IBM Kiskit or, or something, and, and they will have compilers uh, or transpilers that will take them to many different machines. Um, you know, for example, I, I think perhaps um, Microsoft is, is a good good example. Uh, uh, many of you may be aware that Microsoft has set up a quantum cloud service. Uh, it's called Azure Quantum. Uh, their partners are, um, let's see, um, their partners are Rigetti and INQ right now. They're also, uh, in the future, will be working with a startup company called Quantum Circuits in uh, Connecticut. Um, but you can use I, uh, Microsoft's Q-Sharp software and take it to any one of those, those companies. And Amazon has a similar capability. 
where you can write something in the Amazon AWS front end and take it to Rigetti or IonQ. Um, um, uh, Cambridge Quantum Computing has their software. They call it Ticket, T-K-E-T, and that supports many different back backends. So um, even though the, the hardware is different, one of the trends that I see is that the software companies, they they don't know which one, niche, which hardware is going to win either. So they're covering their bets by being able to support uh, multiple hardware backends. Um, and then there, there's complete frameworks where not only can you write the programs, the software, the language, but you can debug it. Uh, Microsoft, for example, has a quantum development kit, and they have simulators that, that go with these things, um, debuggers, that, those types of things, things that help control and, and, and set this up. Um, I know a, a one that we've uh, quite interested in, we've been reporting on in the UK is called Delta Flow from River Lane. And that again, I, I know has been designed to support multiple uh, back ends of the hardware developers in the, in the UK. In um, ETH has Project Q, uh, Xanadu has something called Strawberry Fields, um, and, and Amazon has theirs. There are also companies that are supporting uh, various types of hardware boxes to do quantum simulators. You can, of course, simulate a, a small quantum program on a classical computer, but the, the problem is, is that as the qubits go up, the number, um, the complexity, the running time, and the size of the computer needed um, becomes larger. So in France, there's a company called ATOS that has a dedicated hardware box or simulation, and then there are others. And then two, uh, you know, one was just recently announced is our, our companies that are offering what I call um, workflow managers um, that will allow you to create a, a, a job or create a, a program, share it perhaps if you have a multiple team, uh, being able to submit the jobs to to one of the cloud providers to uh, store the results, those types of things. So it it's, doesn't, may not directly, you know, be involved in the programming, but it just is a great tool for people who want to, to actually develop it, particularly as a team. And, and the two that are really specializing in this area, uh, Zapata has a product called Orchestra, and Strangeworks has something, a um, couple products they just announced last week, uh, Strangeworks QS, which is free, and then Strangeworks EQ for enterprises, which will, will help you do that. So the software field is very, very broad, and you can participate in software in all sorts of different ways. Uh, and then finally, there's, there's uh, libraries. Um, one of the concerns that people have in the quantum industry is that there are a number of problems that are well known that are very difficult for classical computers to solve. And there are a lot of sub subject, managed, uh, subject uh, matter experts and people who are data scientists who understand the problem, but they may not understand the quantum. They, they may not have all the expertise to be able to actually program the quantum gates, again, the CNOTs and the Hadamards and all those things, and translate the problem that they know about to the gate level type of implementation you see in the programming languages. So there's a lot of work right now to try to make that as easy as possible. IBM has a term called frictionless computing, where they're trying to provide libraries and other tools where at the end of the day, the subject matter experts would specify their problem and then software deeper down will try to figure out how to develop a program that will, will solve that problem for them. So uh, IBM has a library of, of Aqua. Uh, in the chemistry world, there's Open Fermion, supported by Rigetti and Google and, and maybe others. Uh, Microsoft has its own chemistry library. Uh, a few that have been developed for machine learning 
Uh, there's something called TensorFlow Qu Quantum from Google. And uh, Chinese company Baidu has a program called Paddle Quantum. So I, I, I do think you'll see a lot of development um, because, again, this is probably one of the bigger roadblocks besides having you know better machines and larger machines having uh, the right tools so that people can utilize those and make it easier for people to uh, develop you know, run their programs on the machine uh, is is important and I think you'll see a lot of development in terms of these software libraries um, and of course there's what I would call uh, companies that are doing um, either specialized type of software or, or doing consulting. Uh, I'm tracking over 70 companies that do that, and, and, and here are the, some of them. And it's interesting that some of these companies will have general application support. They'll work in a variety of industries, like finance and, and chemistry and AI and, and, and optimization. And then there are others that will specialize in very specific areas. For example, in, in finance, you have uh, three companies, Multiverse, uh, JOS Quantum, and QuantFi, um, they only work on finance problems, um, but they're specialists in that. There are other companies that specialize in in uh, chemistry or computational chemistry, artificial intelligence. One that's sort of unusual is a, there's a company called BoxCat, which specializes in using quantum computers for various types of image rendering capabilities. So that's that's pretty pretty unique. So again, in the software world, um, a lot of different opportunities, both to be a general supporter as well as to come up with both consulting and specialized software that work in specific areas. Let me talk a little bit about the cloud infrastructure. Um, you know, that, that's important. Um, as I think everyone knows, at least today, the primary mode for accessing quantum computers is over the cloud. Uh, you won't find these machines in your pocket or on your desktop anytime soon. And it, hooking up a quantum computer to the cloud is, is not trivial. Um, you know, a lot of things that you know you may not think about, but of course, companies like Microsoft and Amazon and IBM do because you know they have very large classical cloud businesses is how do you queue jobs? How do you bill for the time? How do you give user permissions? Uh, maintaining uptimes. Uh, one of the things I'll, I'll say is impressive about IBM is they have 19 quantum computers that are hooked up to the cloud right now and keeping all of them up and running and servicing is, is actually a, a significant logistical channel uh, challenge, but they're doing it quite well. And the other thing is, um, how do you provide for the capability to combine classical and quantum computing? So uh, there are companies working on this, you know, doing this, um, but it can be pretty complex. Um, but the providers that I'm tracking right now include IBM, D-Wave, Rigetti. Uh, Qtech is in the Netherlands. They have a, a small sim system that you can sign up for. Um, CAS is the Chinese Academy of Science. Is the University of Bristol. I'm, I'm going to check to see if their system is still up and running. They had a, an early one, um, as well as Amazon and, and, and Microsoft are providing cloud services right now. And then finally, uh, you know, education is important. Um, being able to provide a user community. Uh, IBM has a very large Q network. They have a lot of part, they, they have partners, education, uh, classes, videos, those types of things. But D-Wave and Microsoft and Amazon also uh, have set up various cloud type of partnerships. And um, But very important is these hardware companies, as mentioning earlier, are setting up partnerships and they have official partnership programs with the software companies to be able to provide a greater capability to the end user. And then in terms of supporting organizations, uh, one of the things we do track are universities. There's, uh, right now I'm tracking 153 different universities that have quantum programs worldwide, and it's by country. Right now there are thir 13 in the UK. A lot of government labs, uh, 48 government labs of, of various types. 
I also we also track investors. We actually track 280 different investment organizations. Most of these are, are venture capitalists. Um, there are some um, some governments that will make investments. Also, we track those, and we track uh, those companies have invested into 87 different uh, companies. So, a lot of different, a lot of investment going on. Um, in, in the private industry, and next slide I'll show the, the, the government investment, as well as various trade organizations. Uh, the U.S., there's the Quantum Economic Development Consortium. Uh, I think the Quantum World Association actually gave a talk to Quantum London uh, earlier, uh, either the last year or this year, uh, and, and various others that, will, that uh, are helping to promote the quantum industry. Um, governments are also very heavily investing in uh, this. This is actually some data I took from a, a, a company in Scotland called Coreca that does education, but they published a, a very interesting blog article where they tracked total investment uh, by country. Um, they're tracking, you know, it's over $22 billion of, of investments. Um, the, uh, the biggest one is China. Although, again, there's a lot of mystery in terms of exactly where they're spending it and how they're spending it. Um, some of that, much of that, I think, is actually going into buildings um, as opposed to research. Um, but the UK has, is, is over a billion dollars. The US is over a billion dollars. Um, interesting, some of the other countries, uh, Europe is a very heavy investment. Germany is, is three billion. France just announced the plan to invest over two billion. And the Euro European Commission is uh, over a billion dollars. So uh, quantum is viewed as a strategic technology and a strategic thing. So people, uh, governments are very uh, interested in investing in it. Uh, certainly they want to create an industry in their own home country. At the same time, there's also perhaps some strategic advantages um, you know, always worried about, um, you know, military type of implications or national security implications. So uh, this has been a very healthy investment. Uh, there are some, there are some, uh, com some com uh, countries have put out strategy documents. Uh, the U.S., Netherlands, France, and, and um, Australia have published documents that, that we've reported on over, over the past couple of years to how they're going to develop their own quantum industry. So I, you know, I, I very, very quickly uh, gone through uh, a lot of the different organizations that are there. There, there are hundreds of these, uh, many, many different uh, things. One thing I would want to stress, though, is partnerships are, are really key. Um, and, you know, any organization that wants to develop their small piece, let's say they develop a chip or something, and it might be a really, really powerful chip, but if you don't have software that supports that chip, if you don't have uh, education programs or people that teach them how to use that software, if you don't have cloud access, you, you won't gain the benefit uh, out of that chip. So, so um, it, it's going to—it's a very dynamic industry. I'm, I'm constantly adding new organizations that are coming in. I, I've actually seen a few actually companies that have uh, gone out of business or been merged. Um, and you will see that over the years. Um, I, I don't think, you know, you go 10 or 15 years out from now, there may not be quite as many organizations. I think like the personal computing industry, which I was involved in at one point, uh, that also had hundreds of organizations in building personal computers. And that's now down to you know, maybe a handful now, a dozen. I think you probably, see some more things happen in the quantum industry, but it's going to take a while. It's going to take uh, 10 to 20 years before all that happens. So that's really, um, you know, my, my presentation. I think I'm right on time now, so I will open it up for questions. Thank you. Thank you. It was fantastic. I know you couldn't see the chat because you were presenting, but there was a lot of people commenting the presentation as well as, you know, the great job you've been doing with the, with the report.
Um, maybe I will start with my personal curiosity. You know, it's really, I mean, the, 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 um, the pace is accelerating, right, uh, of, uh, in the quantum world. And also, uh, we live in, a, in an era of, you know, overload of information. So how do you navigate all that, you know, the complexity, the sources? What is your secret sauce to, you know, putting it all together? Well, um... You know, first of all, since I've been in the business, I've met and, and have exchanged either conversations or Zooms or emails with with many of the companies that are, are in the business. Um, you know, before COVID, I used to go to a lot of the conferences. <laughs> you know, like uh, the big one is Q2B, which is held in, in San Jose, uh, California, uh, in December. Um, and I've, I've been to every single one of them. So a lot of the key players there... Um, but at the same time, I have a lot of uh, phone calls. I have meetings like this. I do monitor Twitter and, and, and LinkedIn. Um, one of the nice things about the fact that we've been around you know, for a number of years is that companies will contact me. If they have a new announcement, they'll contact me to um, you know, help get it, get it publicized. Um, uh, I will mention that, you know, part of our mission is to provide a service to the quantum industry. We do, for example, we have a jobs page, and any organization that wants to let people know that they have some job openings, they can send it to me, and we will post it at no charge. So uh, we do that, as, as well as maintaining a lot of these tables. I know a lot of researchers will use these tables to track, to track um, the to track what's happening in, in quantum. So I, I just have a variety of different sources that I try to use to, to uh, find, find out what's happening. But you are right. Um, it's getting heavier and heavier. It wasn't quite as busy. wasn't quite as busy cut two, three years ago as I am right now. Yeah, no, I can imagine that. I really, really liked uh, your slide with, with the stack. I think it provides a great... Um, reference framework to understand, you know, and uh, categorize and structure a bit of, of this complexity. And also, I was really happy to see the, the users and the communities uh, at the very, very top of, of the stack. Can you maybe tell us a bit more around that, you know, what's happening on that specific space in terms of users and the community which are emerging? Well, um, you know, I, IBM is, is probably the, the heaviest has done that the most. IBM has something they call the Q network. So, and the Q network is composed of several different types of organizations. Um, they have a specific program for software companies they call software partners. And these are companies that develop software for quantum computing and they will provide them with you know, certain types of accesses. Um, they've held meetings for these people. They'll provide various types of encouragement and, and support so these companies can develop programs and, and run applications on the IBM Q network. They also uh, work with universities. They have many universities that are, are involved. Uh, again, these universities will have various types of special access. Um, they also have paying customers. You know, that's IBM's in the business uh, right now of selling time on their machines. And um, what they have done is, I mentioned earlier, they have 19 machines. They have, oh, I don't know, maybe half a dozen or so machines that are free and open. And these are the lower, lower performance machines, like the five qubit machines, which is great for students who want to learn how to do the basic programming. But if you want to use their uh, 65 qubit machine, uh, that's part of their premium things, and you have to pay for that time. So large companies, uh, BP, for example, just announced that they've joined the IBM network, uh, and, and finance companies like Goldman Sachs and, and many companies. And you, you can go on the IBM website to see what, what they've done. They've also sponsored... Uh, various hackathons. They, they right now they're running uh, a quantum courses. They had a quantum summer school earlier. So so they're doing a lot. Um, IBM may be investing as much in terms of marketing and, and what you might call business development as they are in the technology itself. But Microsoft is doing similar things. Um, um, 
D-Wave has stuff. Many of these companies will have frequent webinars. Uh, a couple company, you know, a couple companies I'll mention right off the bat that have webinars are D-Wave, Q Control, and Cold Quanta, or all three companies. They have uh, roughly once a month webinars that talk about their their products. Uh, actually, one company I'll, I'll give them a plug is called A Quantum. Uh, they're one of my advertisers. They're advertising their webinars right now on our website, so um, I'll, I'll give them a plug. So you certainly can attend these webinars, and, and they're always free. Um, so, so a lot of different companies are working to do that. Um, if you really want a paid course, uh, a very good course is offered by MIT. Uh, you have to, it pays a, a few thousand dollars, but you know some very famous professors like Peter Shore and, and others um, uh, give classes uh, for people who are, you know outside the industry that you can attend over videos on quantum computing. So there's a lot of activity there. We, we do have a page called Education that does mention some of these things. Thanks, Doug. Um, I had a question for you. Um, with all the different qubit technologies and development and this growing ecosystem that we have, is there any sort of standardization um, or a cohesive framework for communication for different players in the field around whether that be benchmarking or terminology? So that you know, people who want to use it as well as people who are building these can kind of communicate. Yeah, that's a that's a good question. Um, there is a lot of talk, a lot of discussion about this. Um, IBM has proposed a metric called quantum volume that takes into account both qubit count and qubit quality to benchmark a computer. However, um, there are many people in the industry who don't think that's a, the best type of benchmark. Uh, I think many, some people would prefer application level benchmarks. There are actually several committees. The IEEE has a committee that's trying to work to standardize terminology and terminize benchmarks. Um, and, and several other standards, people are, have been talking about that. But um, there's really no real good benchmark right now. Um, you know, the only, the best thing to do is if you're able to uh, develop a program and then run that program on a couple different systems using some of these software platforms that are hardware agnostic, um, you can compare the results. And, and again, what I've been told by some of these software people who've done that is it, a lot depends on the specific problem because some machines will work better on some problems, other machines will work better on, on different, on, on other problems. Thanks, Doug. Um, we've also got some questions kind of here in from the chat. Um, we have one question asking, what do you think is the current limiting factor in the ecosystem holding quantum computing back from moving to the next stage? Well, I think um, the, the two things I mentioned earlier, I, I think people are really looking you know, for more powerful systems. Uh, one of the things we publish on the website is roadmaps. So, for example, IBM right now, their largest machine is 65 qubits. Uh, they'll be 127 qubits sometime later this year. Uh, Rigetti has published a roadmap. They're, I think, at 32 right now, and they're going to 128. Um, roadmaps have come out from um, IonQ, uh, Honeywell, several others. The One of the things that, you know, people are, you know, would like to see is a quantum machine that can, and a quantum application that can actually deliver better results than you can on a on a cla classical computer. Um, two terms that uh, we we talk about. One is called quantum supremacy, which is actually something that Google did with their 53 qubit machine. They had a uh, I call it a artificial problem. They, they made up a very specific problem that they knew a quantum computer would do well and a classical computer wouldn't. And they showed that the quantum computer was able to solve that problem uh, in 200 seconds and a classical computer would take something like 10,000 years to do that. The problem was it's not a real world problem. So the next step is uh, what, what we call quantum advantage, where you show that quantum is better 
but you really need a machine, you know, for a real world problem, something that people would find valuable. And you, you certainly need a quantum computer that has good qubit quality and has greater than 50 qubits because it has under 50 qubits, you would be able to simulate the problem on a classical computer. So um, I think that you'll see a breakthrough, probably an announcement over the next uh, year or so um, that people have hit quantum advantage. You'll, you'll see the fact that the larger machines that I've just talked about are available. And at the same time, you'll see, again, more software that improves the ease of use. I think all of that will um, help accelerate quantum and, and actually making quantum useful instead of being a research project. The, the time scale, I think I just posted a question in the chat saying, is it true that in the next five, five years there's going to be a huge leap in quantum computing and a lot of opportunities for in the forming? What is your take on that? It's clearly it's difficult to predict the future, but can you give us a sense what you stand in that respect? Yeah, I, I actually do not believe you'll see anything like a step function like we may have seen in, in other technologies. I think it's going to take a, a long time for people to really figure out how to utilize quantum just because it's so different from classical. So what you will see over the next, let's say, two to five years is, is what I would call a trickle. You'll see a small number of people who are um, working on quantum and announcing that they're using that. Uh, it'll very gradually increase, but um, it, it'll take decades, probably 10 to 20 years before people can really use it. And one thing that's important to understand is that quantum will never take over classical. You know, some people believe that classical computing will be dead in 10 years or 20 years or 30 years. That won't happen. Um, I, I believe that really for the next 100 years, uh, the bulk of, of computing in general will still be classical just because you won't want to use a quantum computer to browse a web page or to you know, look at your bank account or balance or run an Excel spreadsheet. Um, quantum computers are for very specialized applications where uh, they have an advantage. So it'll take a while and it'll be a, a relatively sl slow ramp. question asked from all of the different interesting projects going on and companies what is one project you're personally really looking forward to well i, I think um there are a couple things you know, maybe just going back to uh you know on, on, on the application side uh one thing you know there are two there are, three areas that are mentioned where quantum may be used first. Uh, the first is in the finance area. The second is uh, in computational chemistry for drug discovery and, and materials development. And, and the third is optimization. You know, people ask me which one of the, where I think the first people might start using quantum on a production basis. And I, I generally say I think it might be in the finance area and the reason for that is that if you are able to be able to let's say you're doing portfolio analysis and you're able to get another half a percent of interest better improve your interest rate by half a percent if you're running a one billion dollar court portfolio that means a lot of money so the interesting thing is if someone developed a finance application that worked and could be used in the real world, they could put it into production in a week. On the other hand, if you're doing drug discovery, um, that takes a long time and you may find a new drug or a new material, but you have to go through the testing phase. You know, I think we've all seen that COVID was a record it, it was, um, with the with the pharmaceuticals that we have, like AstraZeneca for, for COVID, um, people were able to develop that in, in, 
in 11, actually they developed it, I think in, in a very short period of time, like in a week or so, that at least what they thought it was gonna be, but it took 11 months of testing to actually prove that, that it worked. So you're gonna see things like that happen in the materials world. So it's gonna come on, in my opinion, uh, a little bit slower. But I, I do, do think in the finance area, you, you'll perhaps see some of the very first uh, areas of utilization. Thanks, Doug. Um, we've just got one more question um, before we wrap up. Could you explain um, very briefly for us what quantum inspired computing is? I'm sorry, quantum what computing? Quantum inspired computing. Oh, okay. Yeah, so people have noticed that classical computing has not stalled. Um, even though Moore's law has slowed down, there's a, still a lot of very innovative work that's being done on the classical side, uh, both in, in terms of new architectures, what's called non-von Neumann architectures, GPUs, as well as, as algorithm development. So, uh, you know, one of the things occasionally you'll see is that someone has come up with a quantum algorithm. They think, oh, we finally figured out a way to do it better than classical. And then someone goes back and they look at how the quantum algorithm worked and they figured out how to do something very similar in the classical approach. And, and actually there was a very famous thing, a um, uh, problem that was called the Netflix recommendation problem. You know, if you use Netflix and you see a series of movies um, and Netflix will then suggest you based on what you saw before, and based on uh, other users who have downloaded Netflix, what movie you might want to see next. And, and it's that a problem that someone, uh, oh, maybe five years ago, they published a quantum algorithm to solve that. And they said it was much, much better than anything you can do classical. And then um, maybe two years ago, three years ago, a, it was actually an undergraduate student, a, a, a woman who was a senior at the University of Texas, looked at it and she figured out how to how to uh, come up with a better way of doing it classically. So uh, classical computing is not dead and, and basically quantum inspired computing is taking a look at a problem, seeing how quantum would solve it and figuring out a way to be able to use classical type of uh, technology in order to come up with something that's similar. audience a few reminders of some of the exciting upcoming events on Quantum London. So on the 15th of March we'll be joined by Marco Paney from Rigetti Computing and Alexei Kondratier from Standard Chartered Bank where Marco will be updating us on the UK's quantum computer which Rigetti are providing and Alexei will be talking about some of the financial services specific applications of quantum computing. Then also on the 16th and 17th of March, Quantum Business Europe are hosting a brilliant two-day digital event exploring the business implications of quantum computing and there will be insights and talks from 50 speakers including some of the major key players in the quantum ecosystem. And here at Quantum London, we're really pleased to be able to offer all our members a 25% discount on tickets to that event. And so if you to just see how you can redeem those tickets, we'll put a link in the um, chat and you just can follow instructions there. We'll also be holding our usual roundtable stances sessions and our coding sessions, which are now a regular event at Quantum London. So watch out in our LinkedIn and our meetup groups for further updates on those and when we'll be holding them next. Um, and of course, you can always find all our event info on both LinkedIn and on um, our meetup group. And please, as always, let us know if there are any speakers that you'd like to hear from and we can see what we can do. So all that really remains for me to do is say a massive thank you to Doug from the Quantum Computing Report. Um, so thank you so much for your insights and for answering questions and the brilliant overview on the quantum, um, compu quantum computing ecosystem, which is really important for anyone in this space to understand. So yeah, thank you so much, Doug, for your insight and for your time and have a very good night, everyone. Thank you. Hey, thank you and have a good night, everybody.